Chapter 1. The Secret Within the Garden God, you were here all along, and I never knew it. Jacob You've gone a million miles. How far did you get? To that place where you can't remember and you can't forget. Bruce Springsteen An episode of one of my favorite programs on the Discovery Channel is coming to an end, and I see out of the corner of my eye my little girl, Gisela, hiding behind the couch. It must be her bedtime, I think. My thought is quickly confirmed when I hear my wife shout in the distance, Pablo! Gisela needs to go to bed! I pick my gaze back up and smile as my eyes lock with Gisela's, and she motions for me to be quiet by putting her little finger over her mouth and whispering, Shh! Believe it or not, I have grown to love these evening cabarets in which she somehow thinks no one is going to notice her hiding behind the couch. I can't help but admire her tenacity, as night after night she fights a battle she will undoubtedly never win. Like her, I can't help myself each time either, much to my wife's dismay. Eventually, as my wife begins to lose her voice from reminding us that we are breaking the house rules, Gisela and I comply, and we walk hand in hand into her room. This night is like any other night. We pray together, play around, and say goodnight to the two Minnie Mouse dolls that share her bed. I usually lie down next to her, waiting for her little eyelids to finally lose the battle to stay awake. On this particular night, as I lie there, I once again begin to think about my heart and how far it has come in the last few years as I have learned to loosen the grip around my life. After some time, I turn my head over to check on Gisela and see that she is by now fast asleep. As I begin to get up from her bed, I suddenly hear Dad whisper as clear as day into my heart, The Garden of Eden is a picture of your heart. This stops me completely in my tracks. What was that about? I think as I quietly and slowly continue to work my way out of her room. Closing the door behind me and heading into the living room, my wife asks, Is she asleep? I nod my head in confirmation. The next morning I can't shift my thoughts away from what I heard last night. As I lie in bed, I realize Dad wants to show me something new about my heart that perhaps will answer the questions I have been asking. One of those questions has been, When? What? Where and how did all this go so wrong, causing us to believe that living life from the heart is so foolish and unwise? I quickly turn on my iPad and open my Bible app. I search for Genesis chapter 1, and when I find it, I ask, Dad, what are you trying to show me by telling me that the Garden of Eden is a picture of my heart? As I begin to read the Bible, I realize that the Garden of Eden is an actual place that can be found in the Middle East. Its exact location, like everything else in institutionalized religion, has been debated over the years. Yet it is safe to say that it is a real place and it can be found somewhere in the Middle East. If it's a real place, I ask myself, then how can it be a picture of our heart? Some minutes go by and once again I hear Dad as he whispers into my heart, I'm going to help you understand what really happened in the garden, which will then help you see why it is that so many choose not to live their lives out of the reality that is within their hearts. Several days go by without any further revelation about the garden or what I heard back in Gisela's room. I find myself boarding a plane one evening for a transatlantic flight that will keep me in the air for more than 12 hours. After I board the plane, I find my seat and expectantly wait for the boarding process to come to an end to see if someone will sit next to me. Much to my surprise, I am the only one in my section without a fellow passenger in the next seat. As the door on the plane is closed, I smile as I think how well I am going to sleep. A few minutes into the flight, however, I once again open my Bible app and turn my attention to Genesis chapter 1. I begin to read about the Garden of Eden once again. Suddenly, Dad whispers, The way I lived and related with Adam and Eve within the garden is the way I long to relate with you within your heart. The Garden of Eden is a picture where you can see the reason why it is that you and everyone else find it so difficult to relate with me. You see, Pablo... What I want you to understand is what really happened in that garden all those years ago, and how this still affects the reality you and everyone else are born into. I sit there. I'm not exactly sure what he means, although I can clearly see that this is going to take more than one conversation to understand. It becomes obvious that I am about to be taken on an awesome journey where much of what I will be discovering will enable me to bring many things I have learned along the way into a full circle of understanding. Take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and tell me what you see, Dad says. I find the scripture and silently read. God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature. I read it several times before I lower my iPad and look out the window into the dark night. 
The moon is shining in all its glory, lighting up the ocean beneath us. The air outside looks smooth, and so my thoughts are captured as I see all of this and meditate on what I have just read and have been hearing. I sit with a mixture of feeling blessed and amazed at how far I have come where I can actually converse with God as I am doing this evening at 38,000 feet. This has not always been the case. It has been a long process, much the same way a newborn baby learns to recognize the voice of his or her parents. There has been much trial and error, but as I have continued to walk this journey out from my heart, this still small voice has become clearer. As I direct my eyes back to the iPad and look at the same verse again, I realize that even though I have read it many times before, I finally see something tonight I have never seen before. For the first time I begin to enter into the full reality of my real and original identity. I realize that within me, inside my heart, I am one with Dad. As I am enjoying this moment of discovery, something comes to mind that says, So you really think you and God are one? The thought is accompanied by a distinct feeling of fear, which suggests I am elevating myself to the same level as God, that what I am feeling, in other words, is that I am like God. No sooner have I begun to entertain this thought than Dad interrupts me. This is exactly where the problem begins. Like Adam and Eve, you don't really understand your true identity. The enemy knows that as long as he can keep you away from understanding who you truly are, then you will continue to work really hard all of your life to somehow reach the same reality of the garden. Yet all along, even though you don't realize it, what you are trying to reach outside is already within you. He continues by saying, If you remember when the enemy met Jesus in the desert, the one thing he tried so hard was to challenge his identity. As I hear this, I quickly turn to the Gospels to look again at the passage of Jesus' temptation, which closely parallels the temptation of Adam and Eve. The devil says to Jesus, Since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3 I see that this statement is incredibly similar to the one he makes to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 through 5. God knows that the moment you eat from the tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God. Wait a minute. Did he just say, you will be? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 clearly states that we are made in Dad's image and have his nature, present tense. So what exactly are we missing before we can be like God? What Satan is clearly trying to do is plant the same seed of doubt in Jesus he planted in Eve when he challenged her and Adam's identity. Adam and Eve, unlike Jesus, acted on it by biting into the fruit of the tree God had advised Adam not to eat from. Jesus, on the other hand, didn't do what the enemy suggested. He knew the truth and understood that this action would only lead him into the same place Adam and Eve got themselves into. It is so clear. Why didn't I see this before? I think to myself. I understand now how Adam and Eve thought that Dad had somehow shortchanged them and left something out of them when he created them. Yet again, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 reveals nothing was further from the truth. This is why Jesus does not bother to answer the enemy's attempt by choosing not to do what he is challenging him to do which is to prove that he is indeed the Son of God. This is clear as we see again how Jesus answers the devil by pointing out the truth from Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 Jesus knew very well who the source of his life was and whose identity he carried within. I notice the same attempt by the enemy to plant doubt in Jesus about who he is as he begins the next challenge. Since you are God's son, jump. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. The interesting thing here is that the enemy also tries to put in doubt dad's identity and nature as he did in the garden when he quotes Psalm chapter 91. I suddenly see why the enemy works so hard to blind us to the true identity and nature of God. He realizes that at the same time he does this, he is also blinding us to who we really are. This helps me understand how flawed an approach it is when all we try to do is discover who God is without paying one bit of attention to discovering who we truly are. When we discover who we truly are, we discover who Dad truly is. This is why Jesus again counters the enemy by ignoring his attempt to try to negotiate him away from his true identity and Dad's true nature. He does this by declaring the truth. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 7 Wow, how did I miss this? I ask myself. I mean, 
I've always seen this as a test Jesus had to pass in order to be ready to begin his ministry and to set a standard for all of us to follow every time we are tested. Suddenly, Dad whispers, Pablo, this is what happens when you read the Bible through the eyes of your false self. You see everything as a performance and a prescription, a task that needs to be accomplished and a goal that needs to be reached. In the process, you miss the truth that is within you and hidden behind the words that have been written. Always remember that Scripture is like a manhole cover that can only be opened from your heart so you can discover the real sentiment I had within my heart when I inscribed the Scriptures to be written. After hearing this, I turn my attention to the rest of the passage in front of me by reading Matthew chapter 4, verses 8-9, through 9, where once again the enemy, through a clever turn of words, attempts to rob Jesus of his identity by inviting him to worship him in exchange for what is not his to give. Jesus again declares the truth and tells the enemy to beat it, as he bluntly shows him that he is fully aware of his true identity and his dad's nature. These two things are not up for negotiation as far as he is concerned. As I turn my attention to the beautiful evening outside the plane, I once again realize that, unfortunately, this was not the case all those years ago in the garden, nor is it the case with many of us today. I continue to sit dumbfounded by what I am just beginning to understand. I realize that, essentially, in the garden, Dad gave us his spiritual DNA when he made each one of us. Nothing can change this. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not even what we do or don't do, say or don't say, pray or don't pray, decide or don't decide. This, my dear friends, is the fundamental truth of who we are within our hearts. This is our true self, where we are fused together with Dad. We are one with Him. We have His nature and His image placed within us. Each one of us carries this reality within, whether we have prayed a prayer of repentance or not. If this is the truth, how come so many of us can't see it? I ask Dad. In fact, where exactly are we living from when we don't live from this place? I hear him whisper with, I bet, with a million bucks. A smile on his face. Let me show you. I turn to Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 through 17, where Dad tells Adam, not Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. I read this and immediately see the word dead, at the end of the verse, which I have never focused on before. Why did you say that Adam would be dead if he ate from this tree? Clearly, after he and Eve ate, they didn't die. Pablo, you are still looking at things on the surface, Dad responds. You thought that when I told Adam he would die, it meant that he would physically die. You've seen it this way all along because you have seen it with the eyes of your flesh and not with the eyes of your heart. There my eyes are opened and I realized that what Dad meant was that they would spiritually die immediately and physically die eventually, which Adam did when he reached the old age of 930. If they died spiritually that day, then from where did they start living and what happened to their hearts, I ask. I hear nothing more. The silence tells me that the answer to this question is for another time. I have clearly heard what I needed to hear for this moment. Yes, the thoughts continue to fumble in my mind as I try to figure it out. No matter how hard I try, however, nothing makes sense apart from what I have just discovered. As I lean back in my seat, I am beginning to get tired, and soon I close my eyes and fall asleep for the remainder of the flight. What follows is a long period of time where Dad takes me on an incredible journey, where he begins to show me the roles our heart and spirit play in our lives, and why and how the enemy tries to take us out from being able to live from them. I will go on to discover what these two are replaced by, and how this divides and causes us to live under an illusion instead of in the truth that is responsible for setting and keeping us free. One thing I realize now is that by the end of that night, inside that plane, somewhere over the Atlantic, I had begun to catch a glimpse of the truth that would revolutionize my life in the days ahead. I would begin to understand and see that all that had taken place within the Garden of Eden was exactly what takes place in all of our lives today, from the moment we are born. Despite this new understanding, nothing could have prepared me for what Dad would show me next. Prayer God, thank you for this opportunity you are giving me once again to discover who I really am. You know the condition of my life and how I am reaching this part of my journey. To be honest, it scares me a bit. I know what I have heard before about the heart, yet for some reason I want to read more. You know that deep down I long for you 
and want to somehow reach that place where I understand what this is all about. That space where I can understand who you really are and who I really am. Where I can finally feel loved and at peace in my entire being and not just when I get it right. I'm tired of listening to others tell me what you like, love, and want. I want to find this out for myself. So God, I'm going to take a chance and give this book a go. All I ask from you is that you would help me lay down all my good ideas and arguments long enough that I may somehow be able to see what you are trying to show me as I read. Amen. Point of Action God loves gardens. In Eden, it was our will be done. And in Gethsemane, it was your will be done. Take some time to meditate these next few days to see what it might look like in your daily routine to share the garden of your life with God. I encourage you to write your discoveries down and add to them as revelation is given to you.